Onkar, you are the director of engineering at Google. I'm sorry to my students at NYU. I didn't even complete my undergrad. My career path is the master class in do as I say and not as I do. If you were to hire somebody for your team, for example, what are the top three skills, technical or non-technical, are mm. absolutely key to have? So the skill that I think is next most important on the non-technical side of things is the ability to frame your request as a business enabler. I think that kind of salespersonship would be one of the key non-technical kind of skills. It was a point of self-reflection. I was like, man, when was I really happy at work? And I thought about it. Okay. And I got most joy from building software. Right. So a lot of folks that enter in a security role uh -huh. kind of come in with this predisposition that like the ultimate is to go be CISO somewhere. Right. And for all of you that are thinking about a role in security, that doesn't have to be the case. I leveraged myself into various positions. At TD Bank, I was the chief security architect. At Deutsche, I was the CTO of security. At Credit Suisse, I ran product management and engineering for cyber. I found that the right combination for me was being a software engineering leader working on security projects. And I'd encourage everybody to find their own kind of path with this, similar to how our parents taught us to look both ways before we cross the road. Right. If we can start teaching people like, this is how you code defensively, this is how you code in a memory safe language, like entire classes of vulnerabilities will disappear. And I think that's how we really get to the next level, not bug bashing and installing patches. My wife and I sponsor a scholarship at NYU in security specifically for women entering cyber engineering because it's broadly known that women are largely underrepresented in software engineering so we're trying to do our best to equalize i want our next generation to be ready i want our next generation to be secure and prepared so onkar you are part of the regulated cloud solutions team at google you're the director of engineering so can you let us know about what your role entails, what day-to-day -day looks like? Mm. There is no specific day-to-day. -day. It's kind of all over the place. Uh, my day consists, sadly, not of much coding anymore, but mostly talking and meeting. Um, and the people I meet with range from other engineering teams within Google, okay. control functions like our CISO team, um government regulators okay. as well as some of our customers and partners right so our mission is really about how we take google cloud uh -huh. and how we ensure that it's ready for our customers most sensitive highly regulated workloads right we stand firmly behind the fact that google cloud is the most trusted cloud uh -huh. and the litany of different regulations and requirements that come up um, from in the U.S. FedRAMP and impact level four and five, I to Europe, some of the interesting uh, regulatory requirements out there, to India, Korea, Australia. We just launched Israel uh, earlier this week. So yep, lots that. and lots of stuff to keep us busy. Very cool. Sounds good. Being able to deliver a solution that is trusted um, so that it is both compliant and has security components like encryption is absolutely necessary and super excited to be speaking to you about how your role shapes Google Cloud into the most trusted cloud environment. So for those of us watching, how did you become the director of engineering in the security space, especially at Google? What your career journey was like? What really helped you get to where you are? Sure. Um, my career path is a master class in do as I say and not as I do. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I when I mentor people, I usually tell them to you know be thoughtful about your decisions in your career, ensure that everything's kind of tracking to the ultimate goal. But I was I've been completely disorganized and. I say that in a self-deprecating way, but it's also been very helpful. So when I first began my career, uh -huh. it was, hey, cool, I got a job at IBM. And gradually that evolved and evolved and evolved. 
and true to true to what will sound like a bit of repetition mm -hmm. um when i first moved into security which is i think next year will be 20 years that i've been in security right. um it was by total coincidence there was a friend of mine at work he sent me a like a dm on our instant messenger at ibm and he's like ha 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 check out this cool job it's called ethical hacker and penetration tester but what we call red team mm -hmm. nowadays and with a lot of the background that i had in terms of the work that i'd been doing in linux and stuff like that it just made me an ideal candidate for that role and then from there i escalated through various roles at ibm in development organizations and services teams okay. focusing on doing kind of security stuff okay um finally i reached the point in my career where i decided it was time to leave ibm Okay. And like many good IBMers, I decided that my next step was to grow up and get a job at a bank. So I did. Okay. Okay. And um, upon entering financial sector, I kind of walked in with the thesis that I wanted to be either line of business CISO okay. or the CISO itself of a bank. Right. And, and I started with my technical background and I leveraged myself into various positions at TD Bank, I was the chief security architect. At Deutsche, I was the CTO of security. At Credit Suisse, I ran product management and engineering for cyber. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of around the time I was at Credit Suisse. And Credit Suisse in particular, I had to deal with a lot of regulators, a lot of auditors. I was heavily into the risk function. Okay. And I was really exercising all those muscles that you would expect somebody that was kind of prepping themselves on the journey for that line of business or CISO role. Okay. And then I realized I wasn't happy. Okay. And, you know, it was one of these, I'll say there was a milestone birthday defined by one ending in zero or five. Right. <laughs> and it was a point of self-reflection. I was like, man, when was I really happy at work? And I thought about it. Okay. And I got most joy from building software. Right. So a lot of folks that enter in a security role uh -huh. kind of come in with this predisposition that like the ultimate is to go be CISO somewhere. Right. And for all of you that are thinking about a role in security, that doesn't have to be the case. Like I'm a hardcore software engineering nerd and I found that the right combination for me was being a software engineering leader working on security projects. And I'd encourage everybody to find their own kind of path with this, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're more, if you're a lawyer, maybe that ends up being things that are more related to regulatory compliance or legal provisions or whatever it is, but like go what, with what your passion is and then figure out which part of security best kind of demonstrates that. So after my role at, um, Credit Suisse, I went over to J.P. Morgan Chase, where I worked on data protection engineering and did some really cool next generation data protection kind of stuff. Okay. And then, um, actually, through some of the work I was doing at NYU, I was at a conference, and I bumped into um, who was going to be my new boss at Google, but I didn't know yet. All <laughs> right. The wall behind me. And um, we hit it off. When an opportunity came available on his team, okay. I was invited to interview. And uh, then the pandemic happened. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, this was like February 2020. Okay. And then when everything kind of settled again, okay, um, we got reconnected. And this role in regulated cloud had opened up in the meantime as part of the strategy at GCP. Makes and sense. just the kind of meandering path that I'd taken through working a lot in the enterprise, a lot in internal security, a lot with regulators, right. it just all kind of came together. And it was one of those it's... things where, you know, through total happenstance and this kind of random walk down security, uh, everything came together. And that's where I've been for the last two and a half years, doing regulated cloud at Google. Wow, very, very cool. So would you say that you are part of the team that manages the engineers or are you more of the the person that provides strategic insight into where the product should head towards so what is the essence of what you do 
within within Google in the development organizations, yeah. we have I'll say four major roles. We have user experience, so that's user experience researchers and designers. Yeah. We have product management. Right. Product managers are like the I call them the mini CEOs, right? Like right. They the own CEO the, of the product. Exactly. They own the PL for the product. They help to work on roadmaps, stuff like that. Uh, you have engineering, we build software, and you have program management who helps to organize and structure work and make sure that everything's delivered on time, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely fall within the engineering area. But in reality, none of our roles are that siloed. So because of the background that I have, I find myself, as I mentioned in the beginning part when we were catching up, you know, I speak to a lot of people. Right. I Sometimes the person on my side of the table ends up being a product manager. Okay. Sometimes it's a program manager. Sometimes it's our CISO, our, our lawyers, government regulators. It's kind of all in, in between. And I think one of the things I love about Google is rather than having formalized hierarchy and like lanes, we just we just all kind of scrum and we get together <laughs> and stuff gets done. So yeah. one day I'll be talking about, you know, the nuance of key management and how we tackle Kex and Dex and all those kind of things. Right. And the next day I'll be talking to a regulator about what metadata is. So it's kind of everything, anything, everything and anything in between. Makes sense. Very cool. And, and of course, you know, that's how a well-oiled organization should function, right? There should, it shouldn't be a siloed process. It should be a more collaborative process that involves all facets of business. So yeah, very interesting to hear this. For the viewers that are watching, especially majority of my viewers are going to be folks that are in early or mid-career stage mm -hmm. looking into go into cybersecurity or, or risk management type of roles. What would you say is the most sought out skill today? If you were to hire somebody for your team, for example, what are the top three skills, technical or non-technical, are mm -hmm. absolutely key to have? I'm, and I'm going to completely unapologetically show my bias here, right? Sure. I think there was a, there was a point in time in which the industry tried to rationalize that CISOs don't need to be technical or don't need to understand technology that much. And it's more of like a risk management kind of function. Um, I think more and more as the days go by, that hypothesis is proving itself false. Right. And what I mean by that is what we're seeing as we evolve out of security departments that focus on infrastructure is that we just have to understand things like software engineering so much better. Right. Like, what was it, last week when the OpenSSL vulnerability came out, it started off as a critical, it got back, knocked back down to a high um, for the 3.06 and lower code branch. Okay. Like on its face, that seems like a pretty simple issue. But when you start pulling the thread of how to resolve that particular vulnerability, you start to realize, oh man, I need to figure out, one, you need to understand how software is built, right? You need right. to understand what static linking is, dynamic linking is, how to do a proper software inventory, the prominence of your entire build environment, Right. I mean, even if you take the argument that you don't need to be a technical CISO, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have technical people on your team that can help you guide this. Exactly. The second thing that's much more on the non-technical end is when I first started, security got this rep as the department of no, right? And the person that's in security, you'd go to them, you'd ask a question, they'd say no, you'd get upset, <laughs> and you'd either figure out a way process-wise by the security person, like you'd figure out how to get around them, <laughs> right. or you'd kind of begrudgingly come up with an answer that got the security person off your back, but wasn't necessarily your preferred path forward. Mm -hmm. So I think security now is much more of an enabler. And again, I'll, I'll apply a bit of engineering thinking. Like, 
in our very early days when we thought about security technology, mm -hmm. the perfect example was a firewall, right? In your right. firewall, you have a set of rules, and every firewall admin worth their salt would tell you, you start off by denying everything, and then you explicitly allow particular things. Following that same thinking, okay. part of the reason that we have such complex security problems these days is there's nearly infinite problems or nearly infinite choices that we provide our staff, our developers, our business people, our accountants, whoever it is. Right. So the skill that I think is next most important on the non-technical side of things is the ability to frame your request as a business enabler. Like one of the things that we did at JPMC, okay. and we were dealing with an extremely technically complex problem in terms of cryptography, Okay. but we provided a well-lit path. We provided a very opinionated set of methods that developers could use and be cryptographically secure and have a very secure key management system behind it. So what we in fact did is we acted as salespeople and said, look, we're here to make your lives better. Right. Right. We're not here to tell you no. We're not here to tell you you can't do that or to do something suboptimal. Rather, we're coming to you with a solution. And I think that kind of salespersonship um, would be one of the key non-technical kind of skills. Um, outside of that, just being able to apply methodical fact-based decision making. And it sounds kind of trite and sounds a bit trivial, but the amount of decisions that are made with kind of ignoring the facts right. and reacting in the moment uh -huh. that have led to terrible, terrible security issues down the way. <laughs> um, yeah, but that kind of level-headed, cool, calm, and collected thinking Got it. and basing these kind of decisions on fact rather than supposition. Makes sense. Thank you so much for all of the insights. So basically, to summarize, you'd say software engineering skills, just knowing the basics of software engineering, of how things work in the back end is absolutely necessary. And especially CISOs of the future will need to be a lot more technical than they were before. Mm -hmm. um, and and then frame your request as a business enabler, right? Become the salesperson for the solution that, that you want or you're pitching. Um, it really builds that ability to storytell and persuade people. So that's the, the second takeaway. And the third takeaway is use facts, use data to your advantage. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll add one bit to the third point, which is do your best to be conscious of your own biases. Mm -hmm. In any decision that you make, we all have biases. Like anyone that says that they're completely unbiased hasn't discovered what their biases. Right. But the more objective we can be, or at least as far as we can be inquisitive enough to identify where our own biases are, mm -hmm. will help you proactively plan for scenarios in which your answer would be biased. And the reason I caution that, I found as I've gotten to more and more senior and senior positions, the impact of a bad decision is always that much more, Agreed. right? When I was just designing or when I was writing lines of code, my, my impact was quite small. When I was designing whole systems, my impact was larger. Right. Running several departments now, my impact can be quite large for the good or bad. And ensuring that you are thoughtful about the decisions you make, the biases you carry, and how the wake that you cast. So understanding that when I speak to people that are more junior on my team, I have to be thoughtful about how I frame questions to be as open-ended as possible rather than kind of, oh, the boss is saying X, let me agree with the boss. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's a very good point that you make then having that open conversation and that's what really sparks innovation and brings people's thoughts outside and they can be more vocal about what type of ideas they have yeah that's a very great point just know being aware of the biases that we have and trying to be objective about it 
Very great. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. So my next question is, would you say that a college degree from a well-reputed college, say Harvard, Stanford, Yale, whatever it may be, right? Like, w is that an important factor when you're hiring for your team? Um, Google, Google has a long-standing, very structured and highly, well, very well-known interview process. Yeah. And I think in of all the places I've worked, Google is one of those, like it's, it's such a structured hiring process. And I think we, we originally back in the day, the joke used to be, the question wasn't where you went to school, but what year you graduated from Stanford. Um, <laughs> it's certainly changed a lot now personally. Yeah. And um, I'm sorry to my students at NYU. I didn't even complete my undergrad. Like I, <laughs> I I'm, saw that. Again, that's that's the reason I asked this question. <laughs> I love do it. Do as yes. I say and not as I do. But um, I think in any of these, there's the like it's truly it's truly pursuing what your passion is. Now I happen to be, and as I tell my kids, right? I think going to school is the democratization of opportunity, mm -hmm. in the sense that. If you go to school, you have a much better chance of landing, especially in our field, right. a job that is well aligned with what your future career goals might be, as well as, you know, jobs that give you a great degree of upward mobility and things of that nature. Right. I just got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you can't manufacture luck. So the next best thing is to try and go to school. And at least, as I was mentioning earlier, if you consider the fact that my hypothesis is getting some of those engineering basics can make you a better security person, uh -huh. which is also why uh, my wife and I sponsor a scholarship at NYU in security, mm -hmm. specifically for um, women entering cyber engineering, because it's broadly known that women are largely underrepresented in software engineering uh, uh -huh. degrees. So we're trying to do our best to equalize. Okay. Um, but I think the basics that you learn, like not just going to a boot camp, but understanding algorithms, data structures, the math of computer science, mm -hmm. sigma notation, like all this stuff, yeah. while it seems rather abstract as you're going through, the connections you make later in the work world and the way it helps you understand some of the concepts in security are just invaluable. Absolutely. I completely agree that knowing the basics of software engineering is key to, to growing as a, as a security professional. So talking about the scholarship opportunity at NYU, I think a mm -hmm. lot of our viewers would love to hear more about that. How do we apply? What is the opportunity? Is there a link that we can go to to learn more? Yeah. Yeah. It's called the SNK Scholarship. It was handed out once a year. We're now doing it twice a year. Um, so it'll be in March and in September, which coincide with uh, fall admissions as well as the winter semester. And um, it provides some consideration for those that are in need of financial assistance and um, are entering the Cyber Fellows Program. Perfect. Sounds great. And of course, anything that we can do to help to our scholarship recipients or just people entering cybersecurity in general. I mean, we, I know that I'm not going to be doing this forever. I, I don't want to do this forever. Okay. <laughs> so I want, <laughs> I want our next generation to be ready. I want our next generation to be secure and prepared. One of the things that I'd mentioned to a group that I was speaking with in the past was, I think it's our obligation to help and still some of the security fundamentals as people are going through school because it'll allow them to build better products when they get out of school. That's Similar to how our parents taught us to look both ways before we cross the road. Right. If we can start teaching people like this is how you code defensively, this is how you code in a memory safe language, like entire classes of vulnerabilities will disappear. And I think that's how we really get to the next level not bug bashing and installing patches like that's that's all retrospective 
I completely agree. That is so true. The key to a better future is through is through knowledge, is through obtaining additional insight into how we can build better software that's secure, not just fixing and putting a Band-Aid on it. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. I hope this has been good for you. This was fantastic. Thank you so, so much for your time. For sure. Thank you, Priya. All right. Sounds good. Pleasure speaking with you, Amkar. Take care. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.